And here's the thing about being a tried and true believer of Jesus Christ. When you receive life from Christ within you as a believer are sources of life for other people. That's why the cup overflows. This is an amazing thing, he says, exclamation point. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. Now they got to be just puzzled. We know that God does not listen to sinners. And he, so he's, he's getting preachy here. This, this man's getting preachy. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Where would he have learned that from? Probably the Pharisees. Right? He's, he's turning their own preaching on them making them answer for it. He thinks it's an amazing thing. But they answered him, you were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? The Bible says, and they cast him out. They cast him out because he understood something. He could see something that those who had sight their entire life could never see. What a day this man had, right? Going from blind and in the synagogue to sitting or to, to being able to, to see healed and cast out. And there he stands on the outside of his former life and all that he can see as a disciple of Jesus is that he stands alone. This is where he's at. I was really convicted over this. Uh, a, a few weeks ago on Wednesday night, I shared this statistic uh, from the Barna Group. It says that one in five Christians experience loneliness. I won't ask you to raise your hand because you might be the only one, right? That's how we feel in our loneliness. Following Christ isn't supposed to be lonely. But here's another statistic that I think goes hand in hand with this. Just 28% of Christians are actively involved in any sort of discipleship community. Wonder why you feel lonely. We have an urgent, urgent need on our hands. Why? Because we have failed in obedience to the Great Commission. We've fallen short of making disciples, short of being made into disciples, not just of all nations, but of any nation. Not just of our neighbors, but our own children. And there's many Christians today that are falling, that are struggling, that are lacking because of the absence of a more mature Christian with experience and commitment and love who care for them. We've left those who have just learned to see at the gate of their new life and their old life with just enough vision to know and see that they're alone. See, this man would have had absolutely no idea what to do with sight. We've, we've had sight our whole life, and we would just assume that, well, he can see. Now he can figure it out. And that's not the way it works. And, and I wondered how many people have met Jesus, and they stand in their new life in Christ alone. And not just for moments or for days, but for years, not knowing how to utilize what they've been given. 
having no clue how to live life with sight. And and I think if we didn't know how the story of this blind man went, how it would end, we would lean towards thinking he was probably a little bit better off blind and in the synagogue. Because at least he was living and eating and not alone there, right? At least his basic needs were being met there. But I think every one of us would agree that Jesus did a great thing for this man when he gave him his sight. For one, it gave God glory. But when Jesus restored this man's sight, it was life. But it wasn't life abundantly yet. Right? So, before we get really far into this, we need to specify and clarify what abundant life looks like. And I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm going to give you what Scripture tells us about the abundant life. Because if we don't understand what the Bible says abundant life is, then it runs wild in our minds. It runs rampant in our theology. And we get this health, wealth, prosperity, distorted gospel. So we're going to consider the text. So John 9, 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him. Don't miss those words. This is where life abundantly began. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And I thought about this question this week as I was studying. I think it was a, it was a question of hunger. It was a test of hunger for this man. Do you want more than what you were given when you were given sight, when you were made a disciple, given the title of disciple? And we can see by this man's response that he wanted more. John 9, 36, he answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? To me, that's the question of discipleship. That's what discipleship is is founded on. Every day that I open up my Bible or I preach or I teach or I counsel or I have a conversation with someone, though I know Christ, I must ask even more, who is he that I may believe in him? Because there's a depth of who Christ is that even I haven't seen yet, that even you haven't seen yet. He's the ultimate pursuit of every disciple. He's an exhilarating feast that we continue in our whole entire life. And I had to imagine how this meeting, this follow-up happened between Jesus and this former blind man. And I can see Jesus walking over to him after he's been cast out of the synagogue and placing both of his hands on the shoulders of this young man and looking him squarely in the face. Jesus positions himself so that he's the only thing in his line of sight. No foreground, no background, just the face of Jesus. Limiting his perception. More than likely, this man's parents were still near. We know that the Pharisees were still near. We know that this man is still cast out. But Jesus addresses this man in such a way that he was the only thing this man's senses could take in. The only thing he could see. The only voice he could hear. The only touch he could feel. The only breath he could smell. To me, we're seeing the formula 
for discipleship. A closeness. And Jesus responds in the presence of his former life and his current enemies at the gateway of his new life. Jesus said to him, you have seen him and it is he who is speaking to you. Those words changed everything. They changed everything and and the man responds simply, Lord, I believe. And the details of that belief is this, and he worshiped him. And he worshiped him. So before Jesus came back, it was a life without worship. And having found him, he led the man into a life of greater worship. That's discipleship. That's what Jesus did with the blind man. And having found him, he took him from blindness to a vision, but he didn't just leave him there. It changed everything he associated with. It alienated him from his former life to an even clearer vision of who Christ is. And the man worshipped him. Not just sight, but clear sight. Not just life, but life more abundantly. A life of worship. And Jesus goes on to describe it even better in John 10. It's a life of protection and of pasture and of hearing his voice and of knowing his voice. So this former blind man didn't just admire him didn't just follow him, didn't just swear allegiance to him. That was life. But once Jesus found him, his spiritual sight became clearer and he worshiped Jesus. The follow-up was just as important as the first encounter. The follow-up took this man from life to life of deep worship. That's life abundantly. That's life abundantly. And as I thought of this, I I thought of the church, I thought of us, and and in my mind I look around and I I see us here on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and the the joy that we have and the, the community that we have and I couldn't help but think that there is a greater depth of worship that we haven't seen yet because we haven't taken the time to show each other a clearer picture of who Christ is. And I'm not saying that we've done a bad job. I'm saying there's always more. That's the beauty of it. We will never run out. You can't work yourself out of a job in ministry. You can't do it. The abundant life in context is the life that sees Jesus clearly. It's protection and it's life in the pasture of Christ. And the apex of the abundant life is the worship of Jesus Christ. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped. You see, there are a lot of false teaching and preaching and believing out there that promises riches, health, and well-being in this life, and they teach that Jesus is the mean to those ends, but that is not the truth. The context says the abundant life is seeing Jesus and worshiping him. That's it. In the beauty, one thing I don't like about preaching is I have to live my sermon before I can preach it to you. 
So my septic tank backed up again. If you've gone to this church for any amount of time, you know me and my septic tank don't get along. We don't get along. And I'm digging up my septic tank line Friday evening. And I have life abundantly. <laughs> right? I do. I do. You see, our Christian life is distinguished by progress. By progress. It's not like our physical life, right? It's not like it at all where we're slowly falling apart and decaying. No. A Christian life is moving forward, it's a moving upward, it's a moving onward, it's coming more alive, it's being conformed into the image of Christ every day. It's a life of greater worship and better communion with Christ himself. This world offers nothing like that. You see, it's a great mercy to keep people from hell. And we would be fine if that was all that it meant for us. But Jesus will give us eternal joy. See, eternal doesn't mean it starts when you die. Eternal means it starts when you get it. I have joy today, no matter the circumstance, because I see Christ for who he is. And my circumstances don't matter. My wealth don't matter. My health don't matter. My prosperity don't matter because if all I had was Jesus, then I have all that matters. But he gives us eternal joy. He gives us peace. He gives us community of blessed people. He gives us a church to live life with, to walk with, to walk alongside. Life abundantly is right now. And we need each other to have it. We absolutely need each other to have it. How we need each other to have it. I, I want you to think, uh, real quick about the creation account. This, this kind of struck me this, this week. Think, think about creation for a moment. God created light, and it was good. He created the, the sky, and it was good. The, the land, the dry land, the seas, the plants, and the trees, and it was good. The sun, the moon, and the stars, and it was good. The creatures of the sea and the air, and it was good. Animals and humans, and it was good. The only thing that was not good in all of creation was Adam was alone. And he saw that that was not good. And if I could borrow a line from John 9 and place into the account of Genesis, I would say, and having found him, God gave man a helpmate. The very first act of discipleship in all of creation was husband and wife. And if it was not, yeah, Bill, for sure, for sure. And if it was not good for someone to be alone then, then it's definitely not good for someone to stand alone now. And I'm not talking about just in marriage. I'm talking about in this Christian life. Jesus didn't just leave the man seeing. But he came back and he made sure that his sight grew into worship. Look around you for a minute. Look, look, look at these people. Just look, do it, seriously. This will be weird, but it's fine. Just, yeah, yeah, take a look at it. Do you, love, do you love these people? That's probably why you're sitting close to them. That's probably why you, some of you are sitting over here and some of you are sitting over here too, right? We are more like Christ when we are helping others' sight grow into worship. 
That is when we are like Christ. And I thought about this, this whole thing that's going on with the former blind man and the Pharisees and Jesus and, and the blind man's parents. And, and I thought, you know who else is there? The disciples. I mean, they, they started this mess with the question, who sinned? <laughs> Dummies, right? So, so here they says, <laughs> That's the that bad influence. I'm sorry. <laughs> so here's, here's the disciples who would hear these words from Christ. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, look and see that I am with you always to the end of the age. That word, behold, meant a lot more to the disciples once they saw the miracle of the blind man finding his sight. But it meant even more when Jesus went back and found him. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The disciples understood that commission so well, so well, because they were discipled, right? You see, discipleship, I, I understand, it's, it's hard. And, and discipleship is hard because it's a long game, right? It, it takes a long time in, in the work of discipleship. It's a grind, and, and very, very rarely, in fact, most of us will never produce an immediate fruit when it comes to discipling someone. Evangelism is a little bit different, right? We plant the seed, we, we move the dirt, we make the hole, we, we place the seed in the dirt, and even if there isn't any growth or harvest at the time, and usually there's not immediately, we still saw something take place in evangelism. But discipleship, discipleship just waters. It just waters. We, we have a garden at home, and uh, it gets watered almost every single morning. It's a labor. And if we don't water it, we still have to go out and we have to check the soil to make sure that it still has moisture in it. We have to check and make sure that what's growing doesn't have a bug infestation that needs dealt with. Are there weeds that are choking out the plants? Have animals gotten into the garden and begin to eat away at the growth? And discipleship is exactly like caring for a garden. The longer it's ignored, the more time enemies of growth have and the more good things struggle or die and ultimately it's less fruit that is produced i i love what every man a warrior has done in this church for our men it's been it's been an incredible work of god um because it is a daily work on behalf of believing men. It is a commitment to prayer. It is a commitment to scripture reading and a commitment to uh, memorization and discussion. And, and I ask myself this question, how has something like that been so successful? And, and here's what it is. It's because it's biblical and it's relational. If something's not relational, then it's probably not very biblical. So, as believers, we must make sure that we're not leaving anyone standing at the gate. Alienated from their former life, given sight to do 
what? To have what? Maybe they just don't know yet. You see, salvation is the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, what if we were just left standing there? What if we were just left with that? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Life hits you and you get frustrated because I shall not want. I shall not want. I have a shepherd, I shall not want. But discipleship, see, discipleship is getting a better view of the shepherd and it's teaching others the shepherd king's psalm, seeing and then singing together of the green pastures of the waters of rest, of the table that's been prepared for us in the presence of our enemies in our cups overflowing. So now when I say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I know why I shall not want. That's discipleship. And here's the thing about being a tried and true believer of Jesus Christ. When you receive life from Christ within you as a believer are sources of life for other people. That's why the cup overflows. Discipleship is a pursuit together for a quality of life that is characterized by the Holy Spirit. It's not health, wealth, and prosperity. It is character formation, and that only happens relationally. That's why Matthew 4, 19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There's a character thing in that. So you can listen to sermons all day long. You can read all day long and have quiet times and prayer times and you will see very little to no growth until you connect relationally with someone. The blind man's life was changed when Christ was passing by one day. But it was made abundant by the follow-up. It was a focus on the man's character, not just giving him information. Jesus would remind his followers every day of who they were in him. Not just in a classroom setting, but he did it in a life setting. He lived life with them. So discipleship is coming alongside of someone in a way that they will experience Christ on a whole nother level. So I believe that all of us today have a question. Maybe it's a question for you, maybe it's a question from you, but the question today is, who is he? that I may believe in him. Who is he that I may believe in him? What can you tell me that will make me fall in worship? Of him?